Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Today, we're going to be talking about Onyx, which is a new distributed data processing platform for Clojure. My name is Michael Drialis, and I created Onyx. I started this project about two years ago. During the day, I'm a developer at Viasat, a company that designs geosynchronous satellites. I also recently co-founded a company named Distributed Masonry, whose responsibility is to officially look after the growth and support of the Onyx platform. Lately, the focus of my career has been uh, around building distributed systems and commercial analytics products. These two things are very dear to my heart. And I wanted to, to do this project to lay a better foundation for the kinds of systems that I've been encountering lately. If you're less familiar with distributed systems and uh, analytics in general, the workloads for these kinds of uh, tasks often come in two different flavors, batch and streaming. Uh, and these problems are, in fact, nothing new. Um, batch data processing, for example, takes a static, bounded, immutable set of data and applies a series of pure transformations and produce, produces a series of immutable output views based on the original corpus. And presumably you would do this because you have some aggregation or indexing to do, for example. Uh, and the trick is that presumably you have so much data that you've exceeded the capacity of a single machine in terms of storage or compute power. And so you need to parallelize your operations over a cluster of machines. And we're actually pretty good at doing this efficiently at scale in terms of the mechanics because we've been doing it for so long. On the other hand, streaming workloads are a much trickier thing to deal with. Uh, instead of having a bounded data set, you receive pieces of your data uh, at little bits at a time. Think of a series of tweets or a stream of network packets. They have no theoretical end and they may be infinite. So you never get to look at the whole data set in one shot. Um, and, and the thing that makes it hard is that your computations now effectively have to become uh, stateful if you're going to maintain these same views again. Because you can only see little pieces of data, you can't do a pure um, a functional transformation over them. And so there are things in streaming that are inherently difficult. They're not uh, incidentally complex. We didn't shoot ourselves in the foot early and now we're kind of nursing it back to health. There are things like dealing with idempotency and atomic state updates and stream disorder, which is like when pieces of your, your data come in uh, out of disjoint logical order, and stragglers, when pieces of your data come in very, very late. And, and these, these things are hard. So I'll let you in on a little secret if you're not familiar with distributed systems. And I don't really know what the politically correct way to say this is, but as far as building distributed systems, as an industry, we're not, we're not very good at it at all, actually. Um, <coughs> Because the amount of intellectual rigor to do the same amount of work as in a local runtime is much higher. That doesn't mean you need to be any smarter to do it. It just means it's going to take more time and effort to do roughly the same amount of work. Because the, the thing is, we try to go and build little distributed elements alongside of our applications because we reach and we need to keep moving. So when you tell me that you implemented your own heartbeat mechanism to serve fault tolerancy on your mobile application, I know that your distributed system that you rolled from hand and didn't look at algorithms or the literature really looks like this under the hood. Uh, there's, there's no way you got it right. I mean, I've worked on teams that have implemented their own leader election protocols, and someone was on call at 2 in the morning when the algorithm elected like 16 leaders, and someone needed to go fix that. It's just it's crazy what's out there. So I built Onyx to have a set of distributed primitives that could reliably reach you with a high degree of confidence that it was going to work. I didn't want to reach while I'm trying to do my application level work. So we're focused on the distributed elements here. So if I was going to give you the 60 second elevator pitch about what Onyx is, I would tell you that it's a scalable, distributed, fault tolerant, high performance data processing platform uh, that is able to handle both batch and streaming workloads through a hybrid interface with a technique known as punctuated streams. Its architecture is almost entirely unique in this space in that it's coordinated through a masterless protocol with a custom network overlay for fault detection. It's written purely in Clojure in a relatively slim 6,000 lines. And as a result, the programs that you write on top of Onyx are very idiomatic Clojure programs. But finally, the, result, the, the sole reason for Onyx's existence is to advance an idea I had uh, to divorce the traditional model of distributed execution. And I wanted to split it into two pieces, a set of behaviors and a specification of execution for what to do with those behaviors. And everything else that I've done with this platform is secondary to this goal. We'll spend the rest of the talk discussing why this is important and how you actually leverage it. 
So engineers, like I was saying, have basically been at it for decades, making tons of frameworks to try and make it easier to process data at scale with a variety of interfaces, APIs, consistency guarantees. Um, how many of in, you in here have used one of these before or something similar? Yeah, a lot of you, right? It's, it's getting really common now. So if you're gonna do something new in this space, you have, to, you have to pass what's called the so what test because you're gonna get burned by another project that has more time, more money, or more people. It's just a lot of competition here. And I've used a fair number of the frameworks on this slide, or at least I studied them while I was designing Onyx. And I'll assert that virtually all of them are suffering from a critical flaw that's making development tougher in the face of increasingly difficult requirements from the analytics space. And it's this insidious problem that revolves around our basic understanding about how we're building these kinds of systems in the first place. And that is a relatively big claim to make. So I wanna move from the abstract back into an example that's more concrete. So this is a pretty typical slice of a program that you would deploy to a cluster if you were writing uh, a distributed system. And this happens to be Apache Storm, which is a streaming framework uh, for Java and Clojure. And the idea is that you sit down at your editor and you write your program. Uh, and you specify what the steps of your computation are, what the actual computation is, how it's wired together, what the fields of the data look like, uh, and your serialization policies. You, you specify the whole nine yards in this program. Uh, and and this, the idea is that you have the illusion and the abstraction that everything feels local to your language uh, because you're programming against Storm's API in the moment. When you finish articulating these details, you sit down at a terminal and you compile your program. And for us in Clojure, that means you make an Uber jar. Um, you take your, your program, which is now a binary artifact, and you pass it to Storm's main coordination node known as Nimbus. And Nimbus will orchestrate the transfer of your artifact to the worker machines. Uh, and when it lands on those machines, your program is off and running as Storm is able to hook into it. And I'm not picking on Storm during this talk. This is a very stereotypical workflow with how you would use these kinds of systems. You work in an editor, you compile, you deploy. And so the question I had when I was exploring and conceptualizing what Onyx could be was, well, what happens when the amount of information you know about your program progresses towards zero at compilation time? And what does that mean? And why is that important? And what I discovered was that there's this revelation that we hurt when we relentlessly cling to code and we have an absence of data, which is very contrary to the way that we work in Lisp. We'll look at that code again from the previous slide, but you'll see some amount of data structures, but it's used in a utilitarian sense. It's not part of you know, the philosophical design of that API. So I started to look at things differently and I wanted to see how do you pull this apart? Um, and so in Onyx, this is how it happens to work. Instead of having a program with everything in it, we slim it down and you have an Uber jar with just a collection of behaviors. They're just functions, really. They don't do anything. They just wait to be invoked. And via some arbitrary deployment mechanism, we deploy it to the cluster. Um, and your program will land on these machines. And once they're, they're up, they're, just, they're off and running, and still nothing is happening because you, just, you have idle behavior. No one's, no one's actually invoking it. This is the code piece. At a later point in time, you fabricate what is known as the execution specification. I kind of made up this term for this talk because it fits the theme really well, but if you actually go into Onyx parlance, this is called the job. Um, so this is what you actually do with those behaviors, and this is the data piece. It's heavily divorced. Via a more specific deployment mechanism, we deploy that onto the target boxes. And uh, once it's off on the machine, they kind of find each other, and then your program is off and running. And so there's this critical gap in time between these two things that found each other. And it ends up that that is a very critical leverage. And it's the key for simplification for doing more advanced analytics. All right, so here's the deal. Most of us here have built careers out of manipulating data in its essential form. We have techniques for extracting petabytes of data from remote storage, rolling it up, and turning it into single screen executive summaries. Why is it that when it comes to this specific area in software engineering, we throw away our data-driven mindsets? I think it's fascinating that we've elevated programming language to the singular mechanism by which we now capture computation. And the APIs used in existence for today are, in my opinion, superficially different. They're essentially all the same, and they will continue to manufacture our own design problems as long as we continue to do that. But what's more criminal are the trade-offs that we make in the process because we frequently find ourselves trading away simplicity for flexibility. These two attributes are not competing. 
And it's a shame that we're being implicitly trained to think that they are by doing it again and again. We used overstretched language abstractions that turn application designs into prisons. And it will basically remain here until we have more conceptual independence upon the things that we're building. But on top of all this, we're an easily hypnotized bunch. Um, when we see a REPL or an ultra succinct API, we get distracted in this apparently never ending quest for more concision. And I'm not saying that any of those things are bad, but we need to be cognizant of what we're building on top of. Otherwise, it's going to hurt in the next five years because requirements only ever get more difficult. And here's the thing. What's obviously happened in the last decade is that the price of computing hardware has dropped drastically. But what's more subtle is that the cost of actually writing these distributed applications has also dropped because the skills needed to do so have become significantly more mainstream. But what has skyrocketed, on the other hand, is the cost of understanding and debugging the things we build at scale and at higher degrees of complexity. And this is a systemic failure of the way we've grown our own infrastructure. And so Onyx seeks to be the most economical option when it comes to this last category. I wasn't interested in building the most raw, high-performance framework. And I wasn't even interested in building something where the application developer can get up something running faster than anything else. Those weren't important to me at the moment. The ability to reason is paramount to me, because you can always go back and redesign under the hood to get higher performance. You cannot bolt on an ability to reason better about your abstractions. And, and so I really couldn't have come up with a better picture to, as an analogy for how I feel about distributed computation right now. This knot is so visually appealing. It's very nice to look at. All these strands moving in different directions, and in, in my analogy, these are features. Um, they don't overlap. They kind of compose, if you can think about moving the knots around. But there's that knot in the center that represents the programming language. Because if you yank on any one of those strands, everything else must come with it. And if you yank on all the strands at the same time, you can't move anywhere because you're bound at the center inside the language. And so I had all of these thoughts kind of brewing in my head in the last two years while building this. And the underlying theme was always the same. And it's that dynamism necessitates distance. If you want to build something that's truly dynamic, that's ignorant about its own details at its incarnation, and that is resilient to runtime decision making, you must put distance between that thing and its target environment. And we have the ultimate tool for doing that enclosure, data structures. Data structures are awesome. They put distance in time. They put distance in space. There's a whole host of properties that do this. And so to that end, we're going to spend most of the talk discussing Onyx's core API, which is fully information driven. That is to say, there are no functions in Onyx's core API. It's just a pure data structure approach that passes um, data structures from process to process. And we're going to look at it from five angles. These correspond to five features and how we move things from the programming space uh, into the information space. And so the first thing we're going to look at is structure. And this is perhaps the most obvious thing we can take apart, but it's interesting how rarely we actually do it. And the idea is that we like to conceive of our programs as directed acyclic graphs, where the roots of the graph are inputs, the leaves of the graph are outputs, and nodes in the middle are transformations to be applied, with the edges denoting where data it can flow between. Now, this is almost universally a good idea for what we've been doing so far, because we have the formal logic of graph theory to aid our understanding as these things get bigger and more complex. Many frameworks do purportedly offer this abstraction. If we take this Spark code, for example, I just picked this off the website. Um, we're just reading in some text, doing some filtering, and then counting what we found. And if you read this code, uh, you can clearly see that there's direction in where the data is flowing. Um, and, and a meager five lines of code, it, doesn't, it, it seems like a curiosity that you have to read the program and know what it's doing to understand the actual direction of where data flows. But as these programs get bigger and more complex, or more, more insidiously assembled by other programs, your ability to understand where data is flowing is really, really important to getting this stuff right. Um, so interestingly enough, Spark sort of does give you directional navigation in that you can ask any one of these objects that you get back for its successors or its predecessors. The problem is that you can't get an atomic snapshot of the structure all at once. And so you, because you can't do that, you, you incur all of the problems of concurrency um, in being able to see the same thing at the same time. And additionally, it gives you its answer in terms of RDD, which stands for uh, Spark's Resilient Distributed Dataset, I believe. So it's a foreign abstraction. And so my tools for working on actual directed acyclic graphs know nothing about RDD. 
So code reuse just takes a huge hit. So rather than having something that is implied and is in a foreign interface, Onyx takes a very different approach. You submit something known as the workflow uh, along as your with your execution specification to explicitly and declaratively denote the flow of data. And so the idea is that you have pairs of keywords in a vector of vector that denote logical stages of work, and you enumerate all of the edges in your graph. So now this isn't implied anymore. It's explicitly stated. And secondly, there, there's no boundary between my tools that work on graphs, like Stuart Sierra dependency, I use that a lot, and this. It just worked. I didn't have to do anything extra because there wasn't a, like an interface that I designed in between these two things. Um, so I got both of those things back. Now, something weird starts to happen when you've isolated direction in your programs. Sorry about that. Uh, because you've abdicated your ability to use the programming language constructs to piece, it, to piece your program together. And people get wary of this, um, but it's just something kind of to get over and, and you know, tolerate for a little while. So we need to back off for a minute and talk about how we connect behavior back to actual structure. If we look at that same bolt that we were looking at again uh, in, in Storm's model, the bolt is the basic unit for a, a behavioral abstraction. Um, there's a few things going on here. So I wrote some code in, in production about a year ago, and I picked this off and changed the names because it was for a client. So if there's any syntax errors, sorry about that. But the idea is the same. Uh, and if we, we take it apart, we see um, Storm's Closure API gives you a macro def bolt, which you declare your, your structure with, and sort of gives you this function feeling thing, kind of. Uh, but there's, all, there's this other stuff going on here, right? So I was basically trying to stick a piece of data in a database. That was, that was the goal of this bolt for Storm. But as it turns out, all this other stuff has to come along with it right in here. For example, there's this prepare phase where I'm setting up some stuff for my computation. There's error handling. There's failure policy. I had to bootstrap a database connection. And that's fine. I needed all those things. It's really important. But the problem is that it all comes right here because Storm's API is so coarse that I had nowhere else to put it. It essentially belongs here. So I wanted to, to bring this back again, and take it apart and pull it back to its more essential pieces. So we ha I, I sweat when I see abstractions on top of functions for these kinds of frameworks. Um, we have this awesome thing in Clojure. I don't know if you know about it. It's called the function, and it moves, it moves data from A to B, right? Uh, so we, and more importantly, functions in Onyx are plain Clojure functions that take data, maps, and return maps, or sequences of maps. And it knows nothing about Onyx. This is a really nice property. Um, and so I've, I've slimmed this back at the expense of moving all that stuff out and deleting it off the slide. It was so easy. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about how we get all that stuff back later. Um, but you can, you can further parameterize these functions. But the fact that they're plain functions is really win for REPL testing already. Now we need to connect these actual functions to positions in the workflow. So this is the second construct known as the catalog. Each entry in the catalog is called a task, which is going to denote a logical stage of work to be executed. The first key, onyx slash name, is going to denote the place in the workflow where it connects to. And this other key, second one, onyx slash fn, is a keyword representing a fully qualified namespaced function. This is an idiom I use pretty heavily, where you can, you can name your functions as a keyword and then at runtime, we actually strip away the keyword and then resolve the actual symbol on your class path. So it's part of your, your set of behaviors. We go and we look this up at runtime. As your program gets larger, you'll build up a full catalog, which is a sequence of task specifications. And it's a major point of leverage, because here, you can parameterize each task with functional, cha functional changes, tune performance knobs, document usage, and the list really goes on. But more importantly, no particular function in its behavioral scope is tied to any specific set of parameters. So you can tune this on a task-by-task -task basis. Okay, the third thing we're going to pull out from the language is side effects, or at least the application of the side effects. Uh, so you're, you're programming along, and all of a sudden, you need to connect to a database, and your beautiful little design is ruined because there was nowhere to do it, and you pull in dynamic scope or something like that. I've uh, experienced this too many times. So coming back to the same example again, uh, I was saying I had to bootstrap a database connection. And the way you do that with Storm's Closure API is via this prepare statement. And what this lets you do, in effect, is build a lexical closure around an inner bolt, that fourth line, Storm slash bolt. That's where the actual 
kind of functional pieces taking place. But the things above that, like that con uh, inside the let, are executed exactly once. So you can set some stuff up and then pass it down to yourself, and you don't have to like connect to the database every time, because that would be really, really bad. Um, and so here I've, I've bootstrapped a database connection. Um, there's, there's two problems with this. Um, so the first one is that, in terms of modularity, I had to actually do the footwork to set my stuff up uh, inside this macro itself. So composability and being able to reuse these, these side effects across pieces of, of, of my application was really difficult. Further, having extra configuration that is uh, runtime discoverable is difficult. Um, because if you want to have more configuration than you have at that point in the let block, you need to reach up into the global context. And this just shattered my program. I couldn't think of a way to do this without having some kind of dynamic scope. Um, so that was problematic. And I tried to have a lot of sympathy for the application developer here, because it feels, it feels kind of bad when this is considered, because this is really in the trenches stuff. Uh, you don't think about this stuff until you're building your app. Uh, so the construct in Onyx that facilitates creation and destruction of state are called life cycles. And I'll depict it visually um, before we get going into code. So with time moving left to right, we think of the task in the center as being the functional transformation. Data goes in, data comes out with new values. There are various points in time where you're going to want to do stuff. You're going to want to execute code, add values. You're going to want to do something. Uh, very specific points in time. For instance, before your task begins, after it ends, uh, and before and after every batch of segments that you see, which is like a segment by segment view basis. And you can, you can hook into these things as many times as you want. Um, I happen to balance these things, but you by no means need to have all of them or any balanced amount. Um, so the idea is that at the before task stage, you're given a context map, which we frequently call event, uh, which contains a number of useful keys about what, what current computation is running. Uh, at every stage in your life cycle, you're given this event map, and you're allowed to add, remove, or modify keys. Um, when you do that, the map is durably sent or persistently sent downstream, so you get, you get the last thing that you, you actually uh, you updated, so you can pass values to yourself. And so you start on the left, and then you move towards, towards the right, and you kind of cycle as you have more segments, just rotating back and forth between before and after batch, and eventually you finish out if your computation is one that has completion semantics. Uh, so in terms of code, we'll look at this first. This is, this is like half behavior, half, half execution specification, because it's very side effect -y. We're doing things. So I want to do two things. Uh, I want to log a batch of segments, and I want to inject a datomic connection. In both these cases, they're just plain closure functions that take two parameters. Looking at the log batch function first, uh, we take the context map, or the event map, as the first parameter. Um, and in our, in our function, we, we peek into it, and we look for this results key, which is like kind of a predefined thing. You can find in the documentation what that stuff means. And then we iterate through it and do our logging. And we return an empty map, because there's nothing to really merge back in. It was just a pure side effect. That's kind of a pun. Um, so in the second case, if I want to inject a connection, like a database connection at the start, uh, I'm again going to peek into that task map and or peek into the event map and grab the task map that is currently executing on this machine. Again, I'm going to key into it and pick out datomic slash URI. So this is something that would be in your catalog, presumably. I'll connect to the database, and then I'll return it as a key in the map, which is merged back into the main map. So then I can use it downstream however I, however I want. So I have the behavior, but I didn't say when it runs. So that's where this third symbol is, uh, inject hooks. So again, these are predefined keys that you find in the documentation what they mean and how you use them, but then you, you bind them to actual closure functions. So this is a symbol. I haven't done anything fancy here. It's still just all, um, all regular closure. Um, so that's the behavioral piece. Now the information piece uh, is th this is how we kind of move things out of the language to, to the degree that you can. Um, of interest, you say what task these are going to run for, and you also track the symbol um, my ns slash inject hooks. So now we resolve this part at runtime um, in order to execute your behaviors. So this ended up being a particularly powerful abstraction offer when you consider that you can arbitrarily chain as many of these life cycles together as you want and change their order of execution uh, as part of your specification, which gives you fantastic modularity uh, for side effects across projects. 
but it's particularly adept at letting you intercept the event map from like a third party, third party uh, lifecycle and like changing it a little bit to suit your application or do some debugging because something went wrong. Um, few other implementations could do it this fluidly because they're usually based on inheritance. And everyone here knows the caveats of that. Okay, the next part we're going to talk about is flow. And this is interesting because it's often not a first class thing in a lot of frameworks. Um, and so you're in, you know, in terms of the workflow, you're denoting all possible paths that data can flow through. But it's not always the case that all pieces of data should float to all downstream tasks. It's a runtime decision whether you want to do that or not. Um, so if you're at a part of your subgraph, function one, and you have a piece of data, do you want to emit it to functions two, three, and four? How about functions just, just two and four? Or maybe only functions three? Or none of them? I don't know. It's a, it's a runtime decision, right? So instead of having a cond just buried in your program or some, like, I think Hadoop's abstraction is uh, output collector or something. It's a, it's a little, it's a little, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a little random. Uh, it's, it kind of pops in your program. So instead of that, um, this is a more compositional approach known as flow conditions. So now you have a vector of maps where every entry denotes where data comes from, where it may go to, and when it may go there via a predicate. And those predicates are, again, same theme, a keyworded function. Those functions are plain closure functions that take at least four parameters. But the, the two interesting ones to call out are the fact that it takes an old uh, and a new segment. So this is before and after we applied the transformation. So you get this before and after look, which is very handy. Um, Flow conditions also offer, offer a basic pattern matcher, runtime parameterization, logical composition with and, or, and not, support for exception handling, and automatic message retry. It, it got quite sophisticated from how I initially designed it, but I'm happy that all those things came out with it because uh, the, the things that you can compose and express are, are very pleasant when you do it at this level rather than just burying it inside the program. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna talk about for the API is process. And this is how we accrete state over time because many streaming computations end up actually being stateful. So uh, this is all the new stuff in the 0.8 release that came out last week. And we did a, a really heavy amount of research with how best to do this and adapted pretty much all of our solutions straight from the literature or industrial proven solutions. Onyx offers a feature now known as Windows along with a companion feature known as Triggers. So Windows are a notion for denoting uh, scopes in time in which pieces of your data fall into. And specific instances of Windows known as extents track that data in a running compounded aggregate. The gold standard for windowing implementations is being able to bucket based on features of the data itself. This enables really sophisticated uh, kinds of analytics, and I'm really happy to say that we were able to pull that off. Uh, but there are different kinds of windows that you're going to want to do. For example, you might want to have fixed windows. So fixed windows have uh, a specific range, and they do not overlap. So you can think of those markers at the top as time periods. And the effect is that pieces of your data fall into exactly one window. So they're good for queries like, give me the total number of clicks per page per hour. But we support different kinds of windows as well. A more sophisticated one is uh, the sliding window. So they, again, they have a fixed range, but they can overlap by some amount, meaning that pieces of your data can fall into uh, multiple windows. And so then you can answer questions like, how many users signed up for my website in the last 60 minutes reporting every five minutes. You always have a 60 minute view, but you get an update every five minutes. Uh, I don't have time to go in depth, but for anyone who's familiar in the room with these kinds of things, we also support global and session windows. Global windows span all of time for cases where um, time, the time isn't really a relevant factor for your aggregation. And session windows are a very expressive thing that lets you dynamically grow the bounds of your window uh, based on tracking a specific entity, such as like a user on your website, and then denote where the session ended. So as you see more data, you can continually grow. Uh, our API for windows and triggers is heavily derived from a recent paper at the Very Large Databases Conference by Google with their data flow paper. And then other pieces of the implementation are taken directly out of research from the University of Portland. So it's, it's awesome when people do things in academia and you like read the papers and then you implement it and it works. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. You should definitely give it a shot. Um, so uh, the API for, for doing this is, is another mostly pure data thing. 
for every task that you want to be stateful, you have one or more windows over that task that point you know, where the task is. And then for each of your windows, you have one or more triggers. Windows are going to accrete the data. Triggers are stimuli that actually do something with that data. So if we pick this apart a little bit, uh, this first window is an aggregation. We're going to look for the minimum age key in all the incoming pieces of data that we see. This is going to be a sliding window of range one hour that slides every 30 minutes. And we're actually going to look inside the data that's coming in and pick out this event key. And that's what we're going to use to window the data on. We're not doing it based on processing time, like wall clock time of the specific machine that's doing it, because that doesn't let you handle um, uh, stragglers and stream disorder. This is the really critical thing to be able to handle that gracefully. So as your window is accreting data, eventually you're going to want to do something with it. This is where a trigger comes into play. This specific trigger will fire every 500 segments that you see, and it'll call a user-defined function for you. For example, we'll just like sync it to Dynamo or something. After your trigger fires, you might want to do something with the contents of that window. In this case, I'm just going to discard it and say, back to, back to your regular state. I could accumulate state over time and simulate something that's like more progressively accurate answers, if that makes sense for your, your target application. Um, we also support uh, timers, punctuations, watermarks, and percentile watermarks as triggers. So there's a lot of out-of-the-box stuff that you can put together to have um, a really powerful story for moving data on demand. And the trick that we're pulling behind the scenes here is that we've taken care of the item potency problem for you. Because normally when you're doing aggregation in a distributed system, you need to be aware of not like double counting pieces of data uh, in the event of maybe like a transient network partition or something like that. Um, and the short story with how this works is that we, we took a really similar approach to SAMHSA and that uh, updates are serially striped to a log abstraction, which we're using Bookkeeper. Uh, and then we use RocksDB, an embedded key value store, with an in-memory bloom filter inside of RocksDB to detect uh, duplicates as they come in. But that's really all I can say about that for now. If you want to know how it works more, um, come find me after. I'm happy to explain. And so that is how you move things out from the language and into the data space. And by doing so, you harness much more power to have more dynamic analytics. Uh, I want to just spend the rest of this talk catching you up on what the state of Onyx is and what the ecosystem around it looks like. So it can process data pretty well, but you have to actually talk to things and then write to things. Um, so the Kafka and Datomic support is really good. I focused on that a lot. SQL and Redis support is, is pretty OK as well, less battle tested. Um, for development, you can use Core Async to send data in and out of Onyx or Durable Q or just an arbitrary lazy seek. And because everything is predicated on the catalog for what to do, the ability to switch between any one of these mediums is, is pretty thin. Um, as far as using this, like a full stack approach with Clojure, with Onyx, Datomic, and Ohm, it's really sweet. Uh, it's not like we just ran a full Ruby stack and we share an operational environment. That's really nice. Um, but these, these three specific pieces of software, um, Three different designers with the, the same taste. Granted, two of them kind of derived from the first. Uh, but, but the idea is that you're not just sharing an operational environment. The, the philosophy up and down the stack is, is really the same. Uh, and so it makes for a very pleasant experience. Uh, this is totally not a toy. I, I did not hack this up in a weekend. Um, about two years of pretty intense engineering effort. And while I said earlier I, I didn't do this to have like the most high performance thing, performance still is really, really important to me. Um, so it's, it's easy, easily able to handle uh, industrial levels of load and into the millions of messages per second without much of a big deal. And as far as I can tell, it scales linearly. At least I ran out of money benchmarking it, so I, I can only tell at <laughs> a certain point. <laughs> uh, to give you a sense for the areas that, that Onyx is covering, uh, at the bottom, everything, that, everything is being held up by a streaming engine, essentially, even the batch computation uh, mechanics. Uh, there's there's a, a involved local, you know, locally threaded environment, sort of like an IPC thing, um, to have efficient execution on the box, as well as the coordination primitives for doing fault detection. Uh, over that is is the information model, which we pretty much discussed at length today, as well as being able to do side effects and accumulate state. Uh, specifically, the scheduler for Onyx is another tricky piece that requires a lot of time. And it's not as easy as just like throwing Mesos at it, because there are very specific things that Onyx needs to be able to understand when to allocate resources. And I haven't really found a good fit for doing that yet. So this is another time-consuming piece. If anyone's really good at these things, I could totally use some help. 
Uh, over that is, is a dashboard for seeing the state of your cluster and what jobs are executing, as well as metrics and monitoring to get very fine-grained details about the health of your cluster at any given time. Uh, there's also deployment infrastructure, so Ansible for setting all this stuff up. But the thing that I really want to stress is that there's tremendous opportunity for compilers. What we discussed today was fully information-driven. And moreover, it's documented in a CLJC Eden file, which we try very hard not to change and keep it stable. So there's opportunity to write compilers from custom APIs to these data structures to execute on Onyx natively. And we can do things like you know, statically analyze closure, uh, data log, or even a SQL or a continuous query language. And you don't need to coordinate with me at all, because there's a published information model with how you compile from A to B. And we'll, we'll always try to keep it that way. Uh, so I, I don't want to say that Onyx is like super battle tested because it's not and we still find bugs and stuff, but people run this in production now and some, some companies run this as really the backbone of their data processor. So that's really awesome and I'm thankful to people who trust me for doing that. Uh, finally, I just wanted to say a huge thank you. There are so many people that I could thank for helping uh, push the platform to this point. But uh, the one that I really wanted to thank was uh, Lucas Bradstreet. I met Lucas uh, about a year and a half, I was doing some consulting for him, and he saw what I was doing with Onyx. And he, he started helping out and sending pull requests. Uh, and eventually he ended up, he's still working with me on this full time for the last year. And to have someone kind of take interest in your project is really awesome. And I hope everyone in this room, if you have not yet, eventually gets to feel what that's like, because it's great. But to have someone drop everything that they're doing when I had no money to give and no opportunity to speak of and want to wake up every day and build this over and over and over again is just beyond the most awesome thing ever. Uh, he couldn't be here today. Uh, I know he really wanted to be, but thank you so much, Lucas. There's no way that Onyx would be as nice as it is without him. So send him a tweet and say thank you. Uh, if you like what you saw, we have a website um, as well as our GitHub organization so you can kind of see uh, pretty much everything. Uh, come talk to us and get her a Slack. We're pretty responsive in there. And if you want to get up to speed really quickly, there's a self-guided workshop that you can you know, do some training in and understand the basic parts at more fine-grained details, um, as well as the lining and application templates that can get you up to speed with idioms really quickly. Uh, that is all I have. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.